He rose to be a political heavyweight with a nifty left hook. <laughs> For 10 years, he served as Deputy Prime Minister of our nation. And during that time, he achieved far too many things to list in a short intro. He was ahead of his time on issues like devolution and climate change and instrumental in negotiating the Kyoto Protocol. He was the architect of the Pathfinder Scheme which transformed housing provision across the city region and under the Tories and the Lib Dems, remember, they pulled up London as soon as they entered down the street. So, I'm proud to introduce to you a true servant of the Labour Party. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the great John Prescott. Yeah! Coming on the car. That's the kind of man uh, Jeremy is, isn't it? I'm delighted to be here in Southport. I had some memories as I come along here today. The wind, certainly the wind, isn't it? There are winds of change, aren't they? Blowing through Southport, blowing through the country, but a change. When I came here in Southport, but to fight this election, going down the is it the Lord Street, the main street there? Takes me back to that time. Now, that is 50 years ago. How many of you here were here 50 years ago? Yeah, one or two, one or two. Most of you weren't, were they? But you've got some fight on to carry on what we tried to do. But you know, 50 years ago, Tony Blair then was 13, still at school. Things changed. What we've now got to do is to get this movement back, to get this man the next Prime Minister in Britain, Jeremy Corbyn. Now Jeremy, I've got to tell you, it might be a bit of a surprise to you today, but the sea doesn't come in at Southport. You've done what King Canute couldn't do. So basically, it's a wild area. I lost the vote here, we increased the vote, but why did we have the election here in Southampton? Better if it was Southport. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those days, I can see it coming. But basically, when I fought that election here, it was after 13 years of a Tory rule. Mm. And they're always the same. Both in 13 years, after 18 years, they always cut the public services. They always reduced the National Health Service. The greatest creation that Labour ever created was a service based upon need and not your ability to pay. But it's all coming back again, isn't it? It's the same Tories. They don't change their spots. And I've got to tell you, when I looked here and fought this election, that was after 13 years. And you know, I brought me a lecture pamphlet. Look, there it is. <laughs> now, that's not the same face today, I agree. But I'll tell you what, it's the same. When I fought this election here, I was dealing with the Tories that had reduced our public services, put our health service into crisis, and basically, that was reflected in my manifesto. Has anybody got my manifesto? Yeah, come on, come on. I'm just going to quote a word. It said, after 17 months in office, because that's what Labour was, it had a majority of four. It didn't get a deal with the DUP to stay in power. It stayed in power. And then it knew it had to have a bigger majority. And then there was an important by-election in Hull, which I was involved in as well. And in that by-election, we fought the election and we got a majority of 90. Why? Why? Because we reflected Labour's values as we did in the last election. Don't ever move away from a party that believes in the many and not the few. And that's what my that manifesto is about. And you know, I just brought 
to go from here, it said that we're going to go in and end the 11 plus. Then bring it back, the 11 plus and grammar school, 50 years after we've done it right. It also says here that we wanted books for 18. Did we deliver it? Come on, fuck. Did we deliver it? Yes! Because yeah! the Labour government works. That was the slogan that we had on here. And you know, when I look at these commitments, both in housing, both in the development, we also said, I can't think of what you think. <laughs> these winds and chains are blowing it off. But all the things we did then, we got a 90 majority because we went back to the public and reminded them what Labour stands for, what Labour's done, our values, and that came out in this election. Now when we come to the point again, we've now got two manifestos, haven't we? We had this manifesto. Yeah. Come on, we're going to win. Team. No, it didn't. What they did, we didn't perhaps win the election, we won the battle, we won the battle, we won the propaganda, and that's why the people in this country turned to Labour's value and turned to this man to be the leader in this country, because he looked honest, he looked credible, he was saying things they believed in. The Now, and the shares have all gone off in this last week. If we talk about the many, not the few, that's the few that benefit after Tories. They're the ones that created. So, we did have an effect. They got scared to death of Jeremy, didn't they? They got scared to death that Jeremy was going to come in and be the next Prime Minister. And that's what this is about. So, basically, it's difference in parties, difference in leaders, and difference of values. Now all those things we didn't do, but there was something else we didn't do in We actually built the Freddy Books. Hey! Hey! You know, I disagreed a lot with what that woman stood for. But why would anybody want to tear apart an animal limb by limb, set the dogs on them, and then sit down? Enjoyed the spectacle as in sport of pleasure. They didn't do it. Now this is not the same one at the election. He was so pleased he'd been eating, eating and drinking so much that basically he's not bigger. So he's not there, Freddy. That was the fight. And you know, it was mentioned by Steve, you know the better they hit me in Wales. I'm Welsh. I thought, you know, there'd be a welcome in the hillside. You've heard the song, haven't you? Then the mother built a bigger than egg. The one thing I would say, if this party never did anything, it was to create the National Health Service. I, I'll tell you what, I'm 80, 80 years of age now, and I have to go to the medical centres that we built under the last Labour government, right? And I'll tell you what, as they get older, your knees go, your legs go, you have diabetic, you trundle along to the health centre, I just watch them coming in and I say to myself, if they have to think of paying to take advice about the normal illnesses that come with age, 
they wouldn't be doing it, would it? So I look at that and I say, I'm proud of all those people who before me brought in a health service for the people, for the housing, for the education, that's labour. And therefore, to get that, well, we need one more push on in Southport. So we do need to win in both of them. And we're going to do that. Are we going to win here in Southport? Yeah! Are you all going to come here with me on that day and make sure we take the damn Tories out and we turn our legs to the And the one man we know who has given more boost to Labour movement. Who gets more? Who gets meetings like this with Jeremy Corbyn? When I did one of my first meetings, I thought it was a All I'm singing, that's not morality. It's more than that. It's integrity. They believe this man, and that's what we have to do. One big push, every one of us, make sure Sandport joins us. The man the people want, the next Prime Minister, Jerry Corbyn. John might be 80 years of age, but I wouldn't want to dig off him. <laughs> I've been told um, to do a couple of things. One is, um, can people text Jeremy to 78555555? So text Jeremy to 78555 about information about getting more involved in the Labour Party. Because one of the things that we do do well is campaign and I'm proud today to be with a great campaigner, a, a woman called um, Frances Malloy and she's got a campaign called Tired. Frances you might remember lost her young son on the way back from the festival when a tyre blew out and the disgrace of this was that the tyre was 19 years of age and when we tried to get a piece of legislation through Parliament the Tories blocked us from ensuring that the coaches and buses that you and your family and your children go on don't have restrictions on tyres. Please join the campaign and welcome Francis uh, in efforts to try and get safety on buses and coaches. This is a great pleasure for me, um, and what a crowd, and what a brilliant welcome that you've already given to our guests, and I'm sure that you're going to do the same with our special guest, and what a few months it's been for Jeremy. He nearly, he nearly pulled off the greatest fight back since Istanbul in 2005. I knew that would split the crowd. By the way, he's just been on the radio and he's saying that he's an Arsenal fan, so he's also a red in every way. But he recognises that our area is a hotbed for sport, which is only matched by our unparalleled passion for politics. Remember the harbingers of doom who predicted that Labour would be wiped out if there was a snap general election? Well, as somebody said, they were wrong, and they were wrong because they believed the noises from the echo chamber of politics inside the Westminster bubble. And they were wrong because they refused to see the truth of the overwhelming support that there was for a different kind of politics. Just look at the young people here today. Look how many there are around you. And those young people, along with everybody else, use their votes in June to send the Tories a very clear message. They delivered the perfect repost to those in the right-wing press who have all too often conspired to report alternative facts. But people weren't fooled. Social media, for all it tells, was used as a platform to circumvent fake news. And the national group when their spears against Jeremy failed to resonate with the great British public. But let's not be too uncharitable. 
it's true to say that we didn't win the election, but we did win seats, and we were told that that was an impossibility. We won through sheer hard work. We won those seats because we have a mass membership party which has grown and grown under Jeremy's leadership. Yes, the Tories have their millionaire backers, but we have millions of supporters and trade unionists right across the country. And we are powerful when we speak with one voice. Thank you to every single volunteer who did their bit in campaigning for our party. And thank you to every single individual who helped us to return every single Labour MP in the Liverpool City region, except for one. And that lone seat that prevented the clean sweep is one of the reasons why Jeremy's here today. In Southport, the Lib Dems came third in a two-horse race. And Liz Savage was narrowly exed out after what must be said, a great campaign. So uh, Liz is here today along with Bill Esterson, some of our other MPs, some of our councillors. Just give her a round of applause for everything that she did. So the reason we wanted to text is because with your help, we not only can win Southport next time, we will win Southport for Labour at the next opportunity. And nobody knows when that opportunity might arise. So we need to be ever vigilant. If the Prime Minister fires the starting pistol for another unexpected general election, we will be ready in Southport and in marginal seats up and down the country. So on behalf of Labour supporters everywhere, I say, Prime Minister, bring it on. Call another snap general election if you dare. Now for all those who, like me, at times have felt disappointed when you knock on doors and the householder says, I'm not voting, because they're all the same. Let me tell you that Jeremy Corbyn is the perfect antidote to that tired old cliche. You couldn't get much different, could you? Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May, come on. Jeremy is entirely comfortable when meeting members of the public, while the Prime Minister runs away when she sees somebody who's an ordinary member of the public. Look, I know better than most the real Jeremy Corbyn. I proudly served for two years at Jeremy's PPS, working with them day in, day out. And I saw firsthand the energy that he brings to the role as the leader of our party. To be honest, there were difficult times. I saw his unshakable values and principles tested on many occasions, but I also saw his quiet determination to stick rigidly to the values and beliefs that he holds so dear. So despite the personal insults, he himself never got personal. And there's an old adage, isn't it, that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, let me tell you, and let me tell everybody who's listening, Jeremy has got stronger, and so has our party, and so has our movement. Jeremy's authenticity and honesty shine through, whilst others fade in the triangulation of political compromise. Let me tell you, Jeremy is not only ready to lead our party, he's ready to lead our country. Friends, please show your appreciation for the next Labour Prime Minister, oh, Jeremy Corbyn.
uh, tide table, so I'm going to restrict my speech when I see the tide coming in behind me. So will you give me a warning if you see it arriving? Thank you all for coming today. I want to say thank you to Liz Savage for quadrupling Labour's vote between 2010 and 2017. Well done, Helen. Say thank you to her for that campaign. Thank you for the support that you gave her in the election campaign. And thank you to Southport Labour Party for everything that you did. I want to say also a big thank you to others that are here today. To John Prescott, not just for what he just said, but also for the campaign that he had in the general election. The way that uh, Freddie the Fox and John Prescott toured the whole country. The way that uh, so many other people worked so hard in that election campaign. And thank you also to Bill Aston and Dan Carden for being here today. MPs for Merseyside Region giving fantastic support to what we're doing in Parliament and trying to change politics in this country. Now then, we didn't win the general election, that I fully understand. Thank you very much. Somebody at the front row who doesn't have a microphone say we're going to win it next. Thank you. Yes, we are. Providing you're all agreed on that. When the election was announced, uh, you all heard the um, unbelievably well-spoken expertise that came out of uh, the broadsheet newspapers, that came out of all those late night discussions on Newsnight and so many other places. We hadn't got a prayer, we were on the way out, we were uh, going to hell in a handcart, it was the end of the Labour Party, it was the end of everything, and it was all my fault. <laughs> well, something happened, didn't it? We went out there, all of us, with confidence, with optimism, and with determination that we did not want to live in a country where people in work rely on a food bank to put food on the table, where homeless people beg outside the main stations in all the big cities, where young people are saddled with debt for going to university, where so many people are growing up in overcrowded, expensive, insecure private renting flats, and so many people have had a pay freeze, in reality a pay cut, over the past seven years. And so, I think it's our responsibility to offer an alternative to the arid economic nonsense that the Tories and the Lib Dems practiced since 2010. The banking crisis, the banking crisis that happened before that general election was not caused by nurses in hospitals. It was not caused by care workers. It was not caused by any ordinary person in this country or indeed any other country. It was caused by deregulation, it was caused by greed, and the narrative goes that somehow or other the rest of us should pay the price as a result. Well, young people and others all across America supported Bernie Sanders in his campaign rejecting the austerity agenda as so many others have in other places. And so I was very proud of our manifesto for the many, not the few. I was very proud of the work that was put in to that manifesto, the writing of it, by people in uh, our party head office, in my office, in union offices, in all kinds of uh, walks of life and different organisations, all helped us. And we did it in two weeks and put together a document that we can be proud of and unite around. And you know what? It's now its third week because there's still a big demand for it. I checked and I understand the Tory party manifesto was removed from their website on June the 9th. I hope some of you have kept a copy of it somewhere so that we can ask them about it later on. You'd have thought since they uh, are back in government, sort of, that uh, they'd be proud of that document, but they maybe don't want to be reminded of uh, the utterly, well, no, I don't use language like that, the utter, 
utter 21st century approach to dealing with the problems of education by bringing back selectivity in grammar schools. The utterly 21st century approach towards animal welfare in the countryside by bringing back fox hunting. And the utterly 21st century approach to dealing with the problems of social care, charge it against your property if you own one. Well, sorry, all this stuff really is so much nonsense. There has to be a different approach to how we do things. And our manifesto set out what our priorities are. An economy where we invest, invest in good quality, well-paid jobs for the future, where we have a government that is prepared to tax those that can afford it in order to run the services that we all need and rely on. And a government that really would change the life chances of so many in this country. And so we put in the policies there. It took a lot of thinking about, a lot of preparation, because there are big cost implications. But I tell you this, if you want a health service that works for all, a social care system that works for all, a mental health service that works for all, then you have to be prepared to pay for it. And I'm quite prepared to support the claim and the contention and what we'll do, which is to raise corporate taxation for those at the top end in order to fund the services that we need. We can no longer go on with this system not and we put forward a view on education. Now, at the time I left school, had I wanted to, I could have gone to university. It would have been free, there would have been no fees, and there would have been a maintenance grant to keep me at university. All those of my generation could do that. Somewhere along the line we went wrong. We ended the maintenance grant, we ended educational maintenance allowance, we introduced fees, first of all quite smaller, then they rose and rose and rose for university education, and now we have college fees and adult education fees as well. And at the other end of the scale, the shortage of nursery places, the number of children that never get to go to a nursery is simply wrong. And so we put forward a comprehensive view on education. And Angela Rayner, by the way, is absolutely brilliant as our shadow education secretary. And we therefore, 30 hours care, support in nurseries for preschool aged children. No more supersized and oversized classes in our primary schools. A free school meal for every primary school child eat together and take together. And a pupil arts premium that makes sure every child gets the opportunity to learn a musical instrument whilst they're in school. secondary school children, again, the support they need and the proper funding of the schools because too many schools underfunded, too many teachers threatened with or losing jobs because of the lack of funding, and then the issues of college and university education. And so what we said was we would end fees for college, adult and university education, which will mean the next generation is not in debt. Other countries other countries value education and invest in it. We will do the same to give our young people the chance they need and the chance they deserve in life. And so, in the election campaign, so many people put in such effort. Two million more people were registered to vote. And in the campaign, those new voters turned out in huge numbers. Many turned out and joined in and supported our campaign. And it was like, for me, a sort of parallel universe. I was travelling all around the country. I did a hundred events during the election campaign. And I met people in all parts of Britain. And uh, there were people that had never been to a political event before. People that had never voted before. People who never thought about politics before. Who joined in the discussion and the debate. We made politics real live on the streets, in the cafe, in the pub, on the bus, on the train, and everywhere else. And uh, it wasn't just 
a young person's campaign or an older person's campaign. It was a campaign for everybody and the kind of society that we want to live in. And uh, as the campaign went on, the events got bigger and bigger. And the biggest, I think, was at West Kirby, where 10,000 people turned up. I'm sure some of you were there. The beach here, by the way, seems even bigger, but I don't want to start a competition between West Kirby and Southport. And, of course, there was the historic We're All Live music concert. And it was about bringing people together and what we can achieve in society, what we can achieve together. Now, I'm very proud that at the end of that campaign, we gained seats and the Labour vote went up by three million. The biggest increase in Labour vote in any election since the end of the Second World War. Quite incredible. But obviously, we didn't win it. But when we got back to Parliament, it was really weird. Labour MPs were there, cock a hoop and cheering and shouting and, and making a lot of noise. But on the other side, the party that supposedly won were sat there, all sullen, just like their team had been relegated to the second division. And uh, it was as though there was a kind of uh, unbelievability about it. They assumed, because they told themselves, and because all those ever so expert pundits had told them they were going to win, it was impossible for a manifesto that promised to redistribute wealth and power away from the richest and most powerful towards the rest of the community could never get support in this country. Well, we showed them there, didn't we? And so, the reality is they have a majority courtesy of the DUP and we gave them a chance to mend their ways. Well, you remember the election campaign, no hospital was free from the attentions of a Tory MP. No firefighter was free from the praise of a Tory MP. Nobody in the public service was free from their praise and their love and their affection. But we gave them a chance to say, well, how about returning the goodwill and the support that we get from public service workers by paying them properly, by ending the public sector pay freeze. We gave them a chance to do that. And you know what? The DUP and the Tories got together and narrowly voted down what we put forward. I tell you what, we're going to do it all over again and keep on harassing them in Parliament. Keep on harassing them. Harassing them into ditching their manifestos, harass them into dealing with the reality of people's lives today all over this country. And so we thought the best thing to do this summer was to get ready for the next election campaign whenever it may come. We're ready for it and we're doing campaigns all over the country. We were in the southwest last week, we've been all along the south coast, we've been uh, all over this area and this morning we were in Morecambe and Blackpool and today we're here. Next week we're all over Scotland starting on the west, on, on the, uh, at Stornoway in the Western Isles because we are taking the Labour message to every town and city everywhere in the country. And with our membership now risen to 575,000 and rising for even faster than that, we are a big force in all communities around the country. And when I said we weren't a party of the young or the old, we're a party of everybody, we also have a responsibility to bring communities together. There's been, there's been some awful awful racist attacks that have happened. There's been some awful examples of xenophobia, of racism, of Islamophobia, of anti-Semitism within our society. We have to bring communities together. They came together in Manchester after that dreadful attack in their thousands in Albert Square. They came together in London after London Bridge. They came together in my own community in Finsbury Park. It's up to us to bring communities together. United, we can achieve things that are very strong. And I would have thought our Prime Minister could at the very least have said to Donald Trump, you could say something when the Ku Klux Klan and the Nazis arrived in Charlottesville in Virginia. Because communities unite.
United can achieve very much. Communities united, working together, demanding and getting the social benefits they deserve to achieve a great deal. And now we have the campaigning work to do. Education is crucial to us all. So we campaign against the education cuts, we campaign for fair funding, and we unite the communities around cancelling student fees so that in the future they will be able to go to university without getting into this enormous level of debt. And we support the teachers in their campaign, support the teachers in their campaign to bring about uh, an end to the pay cap and decent wages for them. And in the health service, the sustainability and transformation plans, which the other Jeremy spent so much time talking about, he really is, he really is giving, he's really giving all us Jeremy's a very bad name. Those plans nearly always involve the uh, closure of an A&E department somewhere, the loss of a maternity unit somewhere, the closure of a community hospital somewhere else. And whatever they say, it does also revolve, result in longer ambulance journey times, greater, greater risk to the rest of the community. I tell you this, I'm fed up with our NHS being threatened with closure, cuts, privatisation, break-up, and all that goes with it. We want a properly funded, publicly run, publicly owned, publicly employed National Health Service. So we campaign on all of that. But it's also, it's also about rights and rights of work. On May Day, during the election campaign, Becky Long-Bailey, our Shadow Business Secretary, fantastic job she's doing, unveiled the workers' charter points. I think every one of us here would be slightly embarrassed to realise that this country is in breach of international labour organisation conventions on workers' rights. There's something surely shaming about that in a 21st century modern industrial economy that we're in breach of the international organisation's basic standards. I tell you this, the Labour government would give rights to work from day one of employment would make zero hours contracts would give the right to join a great union a big tribute to all those unions for all the work that they do in representing people and today I pay tribute particularly to the Baker's Union for their campaign for trade union rights in the fast food industry including in McDonald's because everyone has a right to be in a trade union and be represented by trade unions at the workplace. But it's also about how we treat the natural world and the rest of the world. The Labour government would not be afraid to pick up the phone to Donald Trump and tell him, quite simply, Mr President, you are wrong on the Paris climate change. You have to support the record. Trump press could have spoke earlier, helped to negotiate the Kyoto Accords, which was such an important step towards that. We live on one planet. As of now, there is not another planet available for any of us to go and live on. Though there are some people who, by my observation, think they do live on another planet. But it is about how we protect that environment. Therefore, we have to be part of that international agreement on climate change. We have to have a sustainable approach to our environment. We have to protect and keep the European regulations we've got on environmental protection, and we don't have to destroy aquifers and watercourses by fracking in the ground either. And so it's the approach that the Labour government would take, it's the approach that our party takes that is so important. What we offered in the election campaign was a vision of what a society could be like. It's up to us now to keep on campaigning on all the issues that matter so much, but also pointing out that a world in which the wealth of your parents and the postcode lottery of where you're born largely defines what happens to you in the rest of your life is wrong. What you have to do is have a society by investment, by support, 
by public enterprise and public operation that gives an equal chance to everybody. You also have to have the principles of the National Health Service and the other public services that we have. In our own lives, we wouldn't walk by on the other side if we saw somebody in distress. We'd do what any human would do. You reach out and help support them. But we have a public service system. We have a government that does pass by on the other side does pass by on the other side and leave whole areas of the country facing the biggest cuts in public expenditure because they're the poorest areas. We have thousands of people who are homeless or living in insecure housing. We have many young people facing the crisis of their lives and their own future through mental health stress. None of this is necessary. There is a way of dealing with all of this and it's called looking at the world in a different way. I'm fed up with young people being told that when you grow up, when you leave school, when you leave college, forget about the idea of good health care. Forget about the idea that you will be able to get uh, good education for your children. Forget about the idea there's going to be a pension there for you at the end of your life. Because they're told all that matters is your individual ability and your ability to tread on somebody else's shoulders to get a bit further down the line. Well, that kind of society can become pretty brutal. Or you can look at it in a different way and say, well, in the 21st century, with all the amazing technological advances that have been made, this surely is the time that we can share and redistribute wealth. It's surely the time we can give hope and opportunity to everybody in our, in our society. And so our message is one of hope, is one of optimism, is one of a preparedness to invest in the future. Now this is not going to be achieved easily. There are going to be powerful vested interests that attack what we're trying to do. There already are. They do it all the time because they want us to be disempowered, because they don't want us to have the confidence to achieve what we know is possible and can be achieved. So we stand by those at the very turn of the last century who did so much to found our party, found the unions, and develop those whole ideas of justice in society. The vote wasn't given from above, it was won from below. Women weren't given the vote from above, they won it from below. Human rights were not given from above, they were won from below. Disability rights, race, race equality legislation, all of which was won from below. And it was the bravery of those people that campaigned for all those things that give us the rights that we have within our society. And that is what is so exciting about the option, the opportunity that we have here today. A Labour government would invest, a Labour government would do everything possible to ensure we maintain jobs in this country by having free trade access to the European market. A Labour government would stand for human rights and democracy around the world. A Labour government would be prepared to intervene in order to support and protect the economies of all parts of the country. And a Labour government would ensure that the scandal of, for example, the way the Waspy women have been treated would be addressed. Would address the issues of poverty amongst older people in the way that they are so much so often so left behind. And so together we can achieve things. Together we are very, very strong. Together we have that strength and optimism. So when we go about this in our daily lives, let's not keep politics as the private discussion you have solely at election campaigns. Elections are not just won in the six or seven weeks of the campaign period. They're won by the mood that there are, there is across the whole country. The mood that there is of what is possible and what can be achieved. That sense of unity that brings us together and gives us all that sense of collective strength. So I ask all of you, campaign with us, Campaign with us with that message. Campaign with us to challenge this Tory government. Campaign with us for what this Tory government is doing to people in this country.
remember those that went before, that we may achieve justice in their memory in the future. And to our young people, give hope and opportunity. To those suffering discrimination, we support them and we work with them. To those, to those that want a different, better way of doing things. That is what we're about. I'm proud of what we've achieved in this party. I'm disappointed in Sam. We didn't quite make it in the general election campaign. But I tell you what, this government can't last for five years. They don't have a majority. They don't have the authority. They don't have the mandate that they claim to have. It's up to us to keep the pressure on them. It's up to us to bring it on for another election. It's up to us to win it for the many, not the few.